Love it. Man, hey, welcome to Real Life. Man, thanks for being here. I'm excited you guys are in the house. I mean, you picked a great season to come to the church because guess what? We're turning two next month. Can you believe that? Our second birthday? It's unbelievable, man. Time is flying. That means we're going to be a toddler, so we're going to get in trouble, amen? I don't know who's going to spank us, but something's going to happen. We're going to get grounded. I'm leading the way, so I'm, I'm going to be doing something crazy. So just come on. You have a lot of fun this next month here at church. But, man, uh, I'm excited what God's doing this season. Uh, next week is a very special time in our house. Uh, we're going to celebrate our Missions Sunday. We were at trips across the, the world this last summer, and, uh, man, we're for all people. And so our church is going to celebrate. Man, what if the church loved all people? And we're going to look into our trips. We're going to have people that went to Niger and, and share their story, get to encourage our missionaries and strengthen them. And we had a family that traveled to the Philippines and got the opportunity to share Christ through the, um, through playing sports through basketball and just just really had an impact just to give the gospel to people who never hear about Jesus. So I'll invite you out next week, man, as we encourage you to be here, man, as we see what God's doing, not just in our community. Barry, you got to turn your phone off, bro. I'm just kidding. <laughs> if it was anybody else, I wouldn't call you out, but I got to make fun of Barry. Every chance I get, I love him. But man, I'm going to tell you, I'll be here next Sunday because, man, God's doing so much, not just here in our community, but around the world, because we believe the gospel speaks every language, amen, and it breaks down every socioeconomic class. It's for all people. People look different than us. It's amazing how you can see people's lives change the gospel. You don't even met, never met before, but you can share Jesus. And so I'm excited for next week as our team presents, and uh, this has an encouraging time in that. Today, we're going to jump into the second part of our series, man, what if the church loved? What if our church loved our neighbors? Somebody say neighbor. neighbor. How many guys love your neighbors? Some of you guys are like, mm, mm, I got, <laughs> how many of you guys got a crazy neighbor? My neighbor's got a crazy neighbor. I mean, I got like bonfires going on. I mean, people, I mean, I'm like, I'm my backyard. I smell like weed coming across my yard. I'm like, man, what kind of neighbors do I got? Who they let in this place? You know, I mean, if you're watching this, I love you, my neighbor. But uh, man, there's so many, there's so many of us who are like, man, I don't know about my neighbors. And uh, I'm just here to tell you this morning, man, we're here to love our neighbors. Man, I'm so excited the church loved me. You know, growing up, uh, I didn't grow up in church. Maybe you have my kind of story. I started coming when I was in high school. I thought church was boring. I thought it was irrelevant. I didn't know why people went to church. And uh, it wasn't until some friends of mine invited me to church and took a little risk, had a little courage, and said, hey, Sean, we go to church with us. And man, I met Jesus the first time I went to a church on a Wednesday night. And so I'm so thankful the church loved me. I know about your story, how you came to church, or what your story of Jesus. But man, I just know the church loved me so well. I mean, over the years of, uh, it's been almost 20 years uh, that I've been a Christian. I'm feeling a little old, right? Uh, 2000, somebody give me one clap. I like that. There you go. Yes. 20 years. But man, it's crazy. Like the, how much the church has cared for me all these years. I've got guys in my life when I met in high school, I was a brand new Christian that poured into my life. I got people that call me every single week, man, I'm praying for you. Man, if you need anything, how can I help you? Man, how's your family doing? Hey, you're always family to us. Man, if anything ever happens, if you need something, I'm always here for you. I don't know if you have been loved by the church. You've been loved by the church. You may like that. I'm saying, I've been loved by the church a few people, so I'm talking to the right crowd there because a lot of us maybe haven't been loved by the church. <laughs> There's a lot of us that would say, man, I don't know, the church hasn't really done something in my life. And uh, the statistic says this, uh, John Maxwell said at a conference a few weeks ago, he said that 53% of our culture, 53% of the Americans around our community will never visit a church. Maybe they're bored of tears, maybe they're burned out, maybe they think it's irrelevant, they won't show up. No matter how maybe seeker friendly, no matter how life-giving we are, no matter how much we invite them or whatever cool thing we do, they're not going to come to our church. Maybe they've been burned out in the past. I had a buddy um, that was training us in our launch training process of becoming a church planter, and his name was Josh, and he told a story that he showed up to a church when he was a teenager, and he walked in, and he sat in a pew, and a lady came up to him and said, excuse me, son, that's my pew. You may have been to that church before. It's like, this is my pew. It's always been my pew. I was here before you. I'll be here after you. You know what I'm talking about, right? We've had a bad experience with church. And so he walked out the back door of church, just really gave up on God. He fast forward in his life, and he ended up playing football in college. He got into a, a real crazy uh, injury playing, and he actually got his jaw broken. And so he lost his scholarship. He obviously lost his ability to play football. He got into depression. He was suicidal. And he showed up to church um, just giving God his last chance, not only God, but giving life his last chance. He actually she sat in the back row of a church and a lady started to approach him and he tells a story in his head like again is this I'm just going to get kicked out like this is somebody's seat and this lady looked at him and said hey son it looks like uh, you need a hug looks like you need a hug can I hug you and this lady just embraced him and gave him a hug like he's never had in his life I'm going to tell you I'm going to be the kind of the church that loves our neighbor amen I'm the kind of church where somebody walks in the back and we're like hey come on sit next to me hey can I can I can I care for you I mean, we're not kind of church that's going to push people away, but we're going to attract people that are far from Jesus. I don't know about you, we want a church that loves people intimately, cares for people. I Man, it's so easy for somebody to walk in and walk out and not experience the love of Jesus, but we want to be the kind of church that truly loves our neighbor. 
May I suggest to you that the problem isn't with the love of God? You know, Jesus was, was hanging with the sinners. The Bible says that he was friends with sinners. He was like the life of the party. When Jesus was somewhere, you could expect there to be a little, little fun, amen? Like he was hanging out with people who didn't know him. He was hanging out with people who looked just like the world, and people loved him, man. He was the life of the party. So it's that idea that Jesus was some religious dude with some robes and, you know, just kind of just floating around kind of thing, right? But no, Jesus was in with the people that need him the most. Matter of fact, the only people who hated Jesus were religious people. Come on, somebody. The religious people just couldn't stand Jesus. And so for us, I would just say the problem isn't really with the love of God, but maybe it's the love of God's people. Maybe people have interacted with somebody that's been a Christian, or maybe they've seen something on TV, maybe they had experience at church, and I know in our society, especially where we live here in the United States, maybe we all have an experience at church. And sometimes those experiences aren't good, and because of that, so many people will never come to our church. Matter of fact, 53% of people that we interact with every day will never, ever, ever, ever set foot into this gathering without us going out. And so this morning, I want to talk about what does it look like to truly love our neighbor? What's it going to look like to reach the 53% of people that are never going to come here? The 53% of people that Jesus is friends with, he wants to hang out with. You know, the number one reason we launched this church is because we want to see people far from God discover life and purpose. The number one reason we launched this church is because we want to see people who don't know God, people far from God. Man, people have given up on the idea of church. Man, I've been around church for 20 years now, and there's been a few seasons in my life where I'm like, Man, I might give up on the idea of church, but I've always had the church love me through all the different difficulties. But I know this, you only get one opportunity with people, amen? Man, somebody shows up and they have an experience that doesn't go well, guess what happens? They walk out the back and they say, man, there's no way I'm going to go to church or I don't want anything to do about God. But we're here to see our community changed. The number one reason to launch a church for people who've given up on the idea of church. Somebody that is far from God. Somebody who doesn't know Jesus. Somebody who looks just like the world and we understand that's where they start. And this idea, this wasn't our mission. This didn't come from us. We didn't come up with the idea of seeing lost people saved. Amen. Jesus came up with this idea. He gave us the great commission found in Matthew 28, 19. He said, go into all the world and make disciples. Maybe a better way of saying it is as you go, as you go to work, man, as you drive down your block, man, as you go play on that sports field, man, as you go study, as you go to school, as you're in that classroom, as you go make disciples of all people, the gospel is called to go out. And so Jesus, he shares some parables and it's found in Luke chapter 15. He gives three parables. We're going to talk about one this morning. And it's found in Luke 15, 4, he says this. He says, suppose one of you has 100 sheep and loses just one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep? And I love this idea. He says, until he finds it. Until he finds it. And when he finds it, he joyfully, somebody say joyfully. joyfully. Man, he joyfully, this is his joy, is to find the lost sheep. He puts it on his shoulders and goes home. He calls to his friends, his neighbors together and says, rejoice with me because I have found the lost sheep. He goes, we're going to throw a big party because I found the lost sheep. We're coming home. And I love this idea what Jesus does. He takes the 99 sheep. He herds them together. He puts them in the open field. And he says, hey, guess what? I want you guys to be connected. I want you guys to have some fellowship. You guys are going to pray together. You guys are going to work together. You guys are going to do life together. Come on, some life groups. You guys got it all figured out. And uh, now that you got that going, I'm going to kind of go over here and get on a mission. And I'm going to go over here and go to find somebody that's lost. I'm going to go find somebody who needs me. And so he leaves the church together, amen? He leaves people connected in relationships, but the person who needs Jesus, he's on his own. The person doesn't have relationships, doesn't have people encourage him. He's, he's a target for Satan. There's, a, there's all this strategy. So he leaves us together so we can be strengthened and then we can leave and scatter and go find the one. This is Jesus' method to reach the world. You know, Jesus wasn't satisfied with having a 99% success rate. Like we have 99% of the sheep here, but guess what? There's just one. And God is gonna go rescue the one. He's gonna go on mission to find somebody who doesn't know him. I love what it says in verse seven. He says, I tell you that the same way there'll be more rejoicing in heaven over just one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need repentance. You know what that means? That means no matter what we do as a church, no matter how cool our Sunday morning is or what kind of party we want to throw, no how awesome our heart and soul night is, no matter how excited we want to be and whatever we do, it will never, ever, ever, ever bring as much joy or as excitement or as a big a party as when somebody's over here reaching somebody who's lost, amen? That heaven is going to get excited about when somebody's on the stoop of a doorstep and they're leading somebody to Jesus. When some person who meets Jesus for the first time there's nothing we can do on a Sunday morning that's ever going to ever gonna compete with the joy that God has by seeing somebody come home. You know what? Numbers matter to heaven, amen? People matter to heaven. Our job is to populate heaven. We're putting up roadblocks from people going down the wrong track. We're going to see people come to Jesus. So this morning, man, if we love our neighbor, man, we got to be all about the gospel. we got to be measuring the right stuff in our church. I've heard it said there's the three B's of church. There's butts. There's but, people count butts, you know? There, 
People like buds. We're going to count buds. How many buds are here? You know what I'm saying? And then people like budgets and buildings. That's what you hear about churches all the time. Man, look, the building's so big. How, how's your church doing? Oh, we run this many. Like, it, that's, how, that's how people talk in the church world. You know what I'm saying? It's the three Bs of church. But Jesus, he, he's measuring how many people are coming to him. How many lost people are found? How many people who need Jesus? How many people are giving on life or sitting in the back row met Jesus? How many of your neighbors on your block met Jesus? My prayer this morning is you walk out of here and you come down your block today and you're like, dude, this is my block. That these are the souls that God has given me. Man, my workplace and where I live and play I and mean, where I study, man, this is a place that God's calling me to. I'm going to own this street. I'm going to occupy this territory because God's calling me. Man, we love the huddle. Man, the church might be the only organization in the world that's more excited about the huddle, come on, somebody, than the play. I don't know if that registered or not. But we get excited about meeting, but we don't get that excited about doing the thing God calls us to do. I'm gonna tell you, I've been a part of a church where it's like, let's be in the huddle, let's strategize, let's get the play ready, and it's like, man, we, we're called to go. Just go, just go across the street. It's our re- primary purpose of our church to reach the lost people. You guys ever lost anything of significant value in your life? Anybody lost anything? Maybe one person or two. I mean, you lost your car keys? Anybody lost your car keys? You're like, man, where's my keys? And you got to find it. You're freaking out, you know? I lost my cell phone on the way back from a conference. I searched for two hours to find my phone. I was dead tired. I'm like, I, gotta find my, I can't live without my phone, you know? And so I finally found it. It was my mom's house. She, she heard it ringing but didn't know how to pick it up, you know what I'm saying? So I finally found my phone. But anyway, we, you know, we, we look for things we lose, right? And so uh, one time I was, uh, I was driving a boat. Actually, been a couple of times. And a buddy of mine... Uh, Josh Cubley, he loves the wakeboard, and he, he's, he's back there. He's, he's strutting his stuff. You know, his hair is flowing. Okay, I lied. He didn't have any hair. <laughs> Who does have hair? I'll take that back. But, man, he's back there. He's strutting his stuff, you know, and he, he, he likes to do this thing where he puts his hand in the water on the wake, like, look how cool I am, you know. <sighs> you, know <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. He's just there. And then, boom, his wedding ring, like, shoots off in the water because this is how he lives his life. He just, and I look back, and I see him look at his hand, and all of a sudden he's like, praise God, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that was what he said, I think. And so, <laughs> praise God, praise God, you know. And, and uh, that's happened twice now that I've pulled him boating. He's, and I looked at his hand this morning. I said, you got a wedding ring? He goes, dude, I never bought another wedding ring. I was like, bro, you need to get a tattoo. He's like, yeah, I plan on doing something. Like, he wants to make out of wood or whatever. But I'm like, man, you're losing something of significant. You know you lost it. Like, you're upset. I said, I'll put a pin in, here on my map where it's in the water. But uh, you're going to have to go get a diver to go get that back. I don't know if you ever lost anything of significant value in your life. This is the last couple of weeks. Uh, my wife, she had called me the way back from this year. Uh, they flown the Mali, landed in Istanbul, and it was going to be early in the morning. And she woke me up with a phone call. It's like 5 in the morning-ish. I'm not even really sure. And uh, she is, in, like, frantic, uh, totally panicked. I mean, I've never heard her so upset. I thought she would something crazy, crazy, crazy. I mean, obviously something happened. And so I jump out of bed, like, what's going on, you know? And she goes, I, got, I need some help. I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I'm in this airport. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa calm down, calm down, calm down. She goes, I man, I got separated from my, my traveling partner, Leslie, and my, our, our baby, Emery. I'm like, okay, in Istanbul, where? Okay, Turkey International Airport. I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to do to help you. <laughs> so I, I get on the Google, because I'm on Google. <laughs> Who knows? So I get on there, I'm like looking at maps. I'm like, there's eight stories to this airport. Where are you? And nothing's in English, you know? And so uh, she's in a different area of the airport. She left to go find some luggage that had got missing and could not find her way back. And for whatever reason, it got turned around and some doors got locked, whatever. And so she's in a different part of the airport. No idea where to go. It's been an hour. She's separated. And of course, the international flight's like leaving in like 45 minutes, right? And so she's just sweating it out. And I said, listen, babe, the chance making this flight is about zero percent at this point just find the kids we'll be good let's just get it going and so she's going up to people literally going up to security guards going up to cops and and she's just sitting there i need your help and your help and one guy literally was like on his phone <laughs> never acknowledged her presence i can tell she's getting frustrated she was getting irritated i mean literally she's going trying to find a help desk she can't even find the help desk because she can't figure out where it's at and everybody speaks enough english to tell you they don't know english and so eventually she got connected with, uh, with uh, Leslie through Facebook. She got on the Wi-Fi, and uh, they got connected, and of course, uh, they missed their flight, and, uh, but they made it home eventually, and all's well that ends well. It cost a little extra money and a little bit of time, a little stress, but she made it. And all I know is she was completely distracted. When she lost Emory, when she lost her traveling partners, it didn't matter about anything else. It didn't matter like looking like a fool in the airport. It didn't matter there was tears flowing. It didn't matter that you looked like an idiot running up to people, frantically asking where something was. It didn't matter. It didn't matter what was on the stove. It didn't matter what your plan was next week. It didn't matter how much money was the 401k. It, nothing else mattered. All that mattered was I've got to find my baby. I could tell she needs to find her baby. I was so excited. I was like, you found Emery. Thank God you guys are all alive. You know what I'm saying? But I'm telling you something. What if the church was so distracted by things that distracted God? 
Like, what if we're so distracted by the lost people that God is on pursuit of? Like, what if we're so distracted, just like Jesus is distracted, like, you know, I love us hanging out, and I love the church, and I'm, I do love hanging out with church people. I think it's awesome. But, man, what if God's like, maybe we're going to be distracted by somebody over here. Maybe there's somebody in your family. Maybe there's a neighbor in your life. Maybe there's somebody that's close to you but far from God, and God's just speaking to you and saying, man, how much do you love them? Like, how, how much do you love them? Does it distract you the way it distracts God? Do you value this person? Do you truly believe that lost people are truly lost? Are you convinced that there's a real heaven and a real hell? Are we convinced that it's cool to be at church and to grow and be in a relationship with Jesus, but man, there's a world that we need to turn around and say, man, I'm gonna go serve the world. Like, I'm not here to have a cool holy huddle. I'm here to go out and make a difference for people who need it most because we're a church that see people far from God, discover real life and purpose in Jesus. So the question this morning is, how do we reach people far from God? How to reach people far from God. I'm not going to give you anything crazy. I'm not laying on a guilt trip this morning. I'm not going to give you something crazy. I'm going to give you just three simple ways. Three simple ways with three simple action steps I believe God can use that you can implement immediately to start seeing people in your life, man, start growing closer to God and reaching people far from Jesus. So here's the three simple things. First one is this. As a church, I believe that we can create gatherings where lost people love to come. When we launched our church, we made a commitment that our Sunday morning would be geared towards people who don't know Jesus. And the Bible says this, it says in Romans 2, 4, it says it's the goodness. And some version says it's the kindness of the Lord that leads to repentance. I mean, you know what that means? That means when somebody steps into our church on Sunday morning, it should be a, a breath of fresh air. Have you ever been to a church and you're like, man, you left worse than you came? I don't know if you've been to like that kind of church service. You're like, woo, man, like I felt a little guilty this morning, man. I don't know what's going on there. Man, that's not the kind of church we're going to have. We're going to preach to God's best, amen, not to people's worst. We believe if somebody comes in and looks far from God, doesn't look like Jesus, man, we're going to accept them where they're at. Man, people can belong long before they believe. Man, we know people are struggling in life. I mean, what kind of church that's attractional to somebody who doesn't know Jesus? If you brought your lost friend or your lost sibling or somebody that's far from God that you're close to, guess what matters to you? Everything. When you start coming on a Sunday morning, you bring somebody who doesn't know Jesus, all of a sudden you're like, man, I hope those signs are straight. I hope that coffee tastes good. That pastor better bring a good word today. I actually had somebody text me last time. I'm bringing somebody. How are you going to do it? I'm like, I hope it goes well. I'll let you know at 1 o'clock, you know. But, man, you know, we want everything to go well when we bring somebody that know Jesus. All of a sudden, we change everything around us. And so for us, man, we're, we're here to help people that are far from God. Amen? That's going to distinguish us as a church. That's what makes us different. And so we say this. So we're all about transformation. We want somebody to come on Sunday morning and be transformed by the gospel. Man, leave with an experience with Jesus. I know sometimes you go to church and grow up and it's an educational experience. It's about information exchange. And you know, that's just making smarter sinners, amen? Like you're just leaving a little smarter, you know a little more of the Bible. And I'm all about knowing the Bible because I believe that's the best way for your life to be changed. But I do believe that our church is called to be a transformational church in the lives of people. When somebody walks in the back and they hear about Jesus and they have the aroma of our church that's just grace-filled, and you say, hey, why don't you take a seat next to me? Man, can I just give you a hug? You look like you need a hug. Then don't be hugging people just because you're, don't be weird, okay? <laughs> but, be, you know, just love on somebody, amen? Can we just care for somebody? Just make a difference in somebody's life because you know they're going to see something different around here. All of a sudden, they walk in. All the time, we get this from our visitors. They come in, or our guests. They come in, they go, man, this church is so welcoming. Every single week. I mean, I know Holly and Drew, they fall up with so many of our, of our first-time guests. And, man, it's been so, so, much, so welcoming. And people come to us, what time do you set up? <laughs> like, you did all this? Like, you put up that pipe and drape, like, that's fun. That's, I mean, there's nothing more fun than putting on pipe and drape, amen? Like, I love pipe and drape. Dusty, you love pipe and drape? And the glory of God, I love pipe and drape. Man, you put all this, what time do you get here? I'm like, we get here at 2 a.m. No, just kidding. <laughs> we, we get here at 6.45. You get here at what, 6.45? You do all this for me? It's like, yeah, we do all this for you because we want you to know God loves you. We has a purpose in your life. They walk in and see all this stuff, and they, it's done so well. They're like, man, this, I can know God. Like, just all the barriers are dropped down. If you care about this so much, I mean, you must care about me so much. And so in our church, like we're four unchurched people. Everything we do is geared to somebody who needs Jesus. Let's never forget that's what Jesus died for. I mean, the only reason actually we're still here in this church is because there's people that Jesus are looking for that need to be found, amen? Like otherwise the church, we'd be home right now. We wouldn't be doing church. So this is, this is what we're here for. We're gonna make a difference. We're gonna be a church with gatherings for lost people that love to attend, man. They're gonna love to attend our church. And so here's my challenge for you. 
My challenge for you is to simply do this. Take two Sundays a year and invite somebody far from God to our church. Just two Sundays. We have 50 Sunday, 52 Sundays in a year. You have 52, 50 for yourself. And I'm saying this all where you have 50 for yourself. So you can hang out with your friends, you can sit with your family, you can take a vacation, whatever, but just two Sundays, man, less than 2% of your time at church, bring somebody who doesn't know Jesus. And I'll give you a little clue in when to do it, okay? So I'll be like, hey, this is a good week, this is a good week, but you know, there's a really good week coming up, come on. And you'll be like, oh yeah, that's when I'm supposed to bring that friend. And so you can just start hanging out with people. You don't have to like take the pressure on you to like present the gospel and, you know, bring down the house and cast out a demon or, you know, you can, you can just be friends with somebody who doesn't know Jesus, amen? And then when I say bring them, bring them. Can you do that? Can you do that? Can you give me two hands up like this? Like two people. I'm going to do two people here. Just two. You do that. I just, some of you can do that, right? Like, I'm going to see people change. You know, I, I'm just going to just make the impact. I'm going to invest in somebody. That, it means we had to hang out with lost people, right? Like, you have to start had to hang out with people who don't know Jesus at all. But man, two Sundays a year. I mean, not only that, we're going to create gatherings where lost people love to attend. But man, make it personal. I man, make the gospel personal. I mean, you got to take personal responsibility to share the gospel. When I mean, you walk down your street, be like, dude, this is my street. I don't know who's sharing Jesus, but I'm going to share Jesus. Like, I'm on that turf, and I put my cleats on. Man, this people, who, who needs Jesus? Like, I'm going to keep my spiritual eyes and ears open. I'm going, to meet, I'm going to meet friends and hang out with people who don't know Jesus. Like, I'm going to take the gospel as if I'm the only person that knows the gospel. Because there ain't no plan B, amen? There ain't no plan B for the church. Like, if this doesn't work, guess what? There's not another team behind us. There's not like a secondary church team, okay? Like, man, we are the church. And so we're going to go forward the mission of God. And I know it's like, oh, what's he mean? What's he talking about? Well, let me give you some simple ways to do this. The first thing is really simple. Just listen to people that are far from God. I mean, you got to make some friendship relationships. And the best way to do that is just hear people's stories. Just, man, how, what, what are you going through? How are you doing? Man, how'd you get here? How'd you move to Kansas City? I mean, what's your story? And the best thing you could ever say, the most two powerful words you could ever give somebody is simply say, me too, me too. Me too. I mean, if you talk to somebody's story and say, man, I grew up, and my, my family was dysfunctional, and my family got divorced, man, I just really struggled with this and this. Hey, me too, man. Me too. I was, in the same, I was in the same situation. I don't know exactly what you've been through, but man, me too. I've had some wounds in the past from my family. Or maybe it's like, I'm going through a financial crisis, and man, I can't afford this and that. And like, we're like, yeah, me too. <laughs> right? I can't do that. Like, man, I hate religion. Yeah, me too. I hate religion too. I hate those preachers, man. You know, I can't stand those people who make fun of Jesus and don't, don't follow him and talk about him. Man, I can't stand that. But I go to church, man, that loves Jesus. Man, me too. We can just say me too, amen. Just me too, me too. I've been there, I've done that. You know, when I was uh, at a youth uh, retreat this last summer, uh, two summers ago, I mean, uh, down at Lake the Ozarks, there was a youth leader and I said, hey, how, who, who's here that doesn't know Jesus? Like maybe who's far from God? And so they gave me a list of the teens and I'm like, man, I'm gonna go hang out with those teens. I'm gonna make sure I, I know them, I hear their story and encourage them to follow God. And one of those teens was Kaneen. And so Kaneen was down there and I got the opportunity to talk to her. She's in the front lawn uh, before one of the night gatherings. And man, I was just asking her like, man, what's your story? Like, where are you from? Like, how, how did you end up here? Like, here at this retreat? Like, I mean, wh- where are you from? Are you from here? And she starts telling me her story about her family and some of the stuff she's going through and some of those relationships that she's been hurt by or feels hurt by. And, and I'm just listening for like 10 minutes, just listening. Say, Man, that's crazy, you know? Me too. <laughs> me too. Like, I've never been what you've been through, but you know what? My dad wasn't there for me. Like, my dad came to one thing I ever did in high school. He didn't go to my college ever, didn't even go to my college graduation. He's never darkened the door of the church, and I've preached I don't know how many thousands of messages. Like, he's never been there for me. But you know what? There's a God who is there for me, and a God that loves me, and a Father that wants a relationship with me. Man, I believe God can do something in your life. Man, it's so incredible. And so I begin to share with her a little about Jesus. And so she goes into the, into, the, into the worship night, and she hears the gospel presented. And I think it was maybe Jenna or somebody on the team led her to Christ later that night. And I thought, man, I got to play just a little piece of that story. Just because I said, me too. And I listen to somebody that's far from God. You might think, well, I'm not qualified to share the gospel. Man, have you been hurt? <laughs> have you been wounded? I mean, have you had somebody betray you? Or your, fa- or your finances jacked up? Me too. Me too, right? Like we can just sit next to somebody that needs Jesus and go, me too, man. Like, I, you know, I used to be addicted to that. Me too. Man, I used to, I used to watch TV like crazy. Me too. Man, my kids are going crazy. I used to have kids, my foster kids went crazy. Yeah, me too. Man, I have all together. Me too. I'm not perfect. Man, I'm just trying to follow Jesus. Me too. And so we say me too to everybody. Can we do that? Me too. Somebody say me too. Me too. Me too. Me too. Man, just hang out with people. Just just have compassion. Me too. Make it personal because all you got to do to hang out with people that need Jesus is just say me too. I've been there. So not only are we going to have a gathering of lost people love the 10, we're not only going to make it personal and make some friendships with people far from God. The last thing is this, we're going to have the courage to share the gospel. And then some of you are like, oh, I mean, some of us are like, I've never done that, <laughs> you know? I've never shared the gospel. 
Uh, some of us maybe have shared it a few times and you felt like you're puking on somebody and been like that. You're like, man, I just want to tell this person about Jesus and I love him. And you're like, no, Jesus saves you, man. I love you. It's like, what are you talking about? Like, I know he loves you. It's like, I've done that before. I puked the gospel on somebody. I'm just going to tell you, the gospel to share it takes courage and courage takes practice. It takes practice to have the courage to share the gospel. So I want to encourage you, man, start sharing. If you don't feel comfortable sharing, just wait for one of those Sundays where Sean says, this is going to be a good Sunday to bring somebody far from God. Me too. Sign me up. Sign me up. Send somebody here. So I want to do, I want to, I want to give you an easy way to share the gospel, a way that I've been using probably the last seven or eight years, uh, something that's been very helpful for me to, to bring somebody through the gospel process. And so maybe it's a little gospel training. I don't really know. Uh, but if you have your phone, uh, you can type this in. You can f- download this app because there's an app for sharing the gospel. Come on, somebody. Oh, man, life in six words. You can, download the, you can download this gospel app called Life in Six Words. You can go to the website, lifeinsixwords.com. And it's a very simple way. Maybe, and I'm not saying you share the gospel because you just want to tell something about Jesus. You got the Bible and you're going to beat somebody. But I'm just saying when you get something next to somebody that's hurting and, and, and needs something in their life, and you love them, and you say, man, if I could take 60 seconds and tell you about the difference God made in my life and tell you about how you can make a difference in your life, would you, we'd be interested. That's your opening line. You can write that down. It's a good place to take notes. <laughs> If I take 60 seconds to tell you how God did something in my life and how he can change your life, we'd be interested. You know, most people are gonna, if you have a relationship with them, will say, yeah, I'd love to hear that. And you're gonna walk them through the G-O-S-P-L, this life in six words, will walk you right through this. I wanna share with you this morning. This is the gospel in a nutshell. So check out the slides. The first thing is this. First thing you're gonna share with them is God created, God created to be with you. God created you, what am I even saying? I gotta read it. God created us, I gotta create you. God created us to be with you. So God created us to be with him. I'm not even reading this right. I'm just losing my mind. I'm so sorry. God's created us to be with him. Man, I, I love this idea because a lot of times we start with the Bible, we start with sin. Man, you, you know, you, you're a sinner, you're not good enough, but you know what? We start with God. You know, God created you. The first thing that man opened his eyes to was the face of God. Now I love that. And then God spoke everything to existence. We you know what? God formed you intimately. Like God gave you a purpose and God put a design in your life. Like God knows your name. God loves you more than the sand and the earth. You know, the very first thing is that God wants a relationship with you. But you know what? Our sin separates from God. Our sin separates from God. You know, Adam and Eve in the garden, they chose to disobey God and it, made, it basically is like dropping, uh, dropping poison on humanity. Like we'll never be good enough for God's holiness and we, we fell from perfection. So no matter what we do, our sins can't be removed with good deeds. No matter how hard we try, no matter how much we read the Bible or we pray or go to church or how many good things we do in life, it's like putting icing on a burnt cake. Get it away, it's gonna taste good. We can't cover up our sins by all this good stuff. But I got some good news for you, man. Paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. Man, paying the price for sin, Jesus went to that cross and he paid the price for all our wrongs, in exchange for all his rights, and you can have new life in Jesus today. The Bible says this, everyone trusting him alone has life. That life starts now and lasts forever. God isn't just looking for you to do something later in life, man. God has changed and transformed you. He's given you a purpose and God wants you to make a difference for him. He wants your life to be significant. He wants your life to matter. Maybe you'd be interested in knowing more about Jesus. And so you just walk him straight through the G-O-S-P-L. And obviously uh, I haven't done this enough because I just barfed that out on the first part, but you may do that too. But man, just share the gospel. Man, there's no wrong way to share the gospel, amen. You're just gonna get out there and start sharing the gospel. Obviously, I've been I've doing this for a long time. I, I can't tell me times I've shared that with young people at the altar. I can't tell me times I've talked to my neighbors, talked to people in my family. I can't tell me times I'll be able to present the gospel that way. They don't know I'm telling them that. They don't know I'm walking through all that stuff. But that's just a simple way of saying, hey, here's the story of Jesus. And so if you don't feel equipped to share the gospel, man, just use the app. Bill, you can flip right through the pictures and just say, hey, you know what? Here's what God did for you. God created us to be with him. I mean, you believe God has a purpose for your life? I don't know about you, but we need to be a kind of church that shares the gospel. Amen. I know it's, it's easy to be like, I haven't done that in a long time. You know, it says the average Christians led one person to Christ in their life. There's no doubt that the church is not going to be successful with that kind of rate. <laughs> like, we got to be like, man, I'm going to lead someone to Christ. God's going to put something in my heart. Man, I, 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 I'm just, I'm passionate about sharing Jesus. Like, I want our church to get this. Amen. Man, I want to love our neighbors. I don't want anybody to walk down our, our block and not heard the name of Jesus and not been loved by somebody in our church. I want every block in our, in, our, in our city to be occupied by people who love Jesus and are willing to share the gospel. And if you don't feel comfortable sharing the gospel, you know what? You're in good company. This is what the Bible says in Proverbs 11:30. It says this, the one who wins souls is wise. You might think, man, I don't feel comfortable sharing the gospel. I've never done this before. Like, I don't feel like I could really do it. Well, guess what? Nobody does when you first start out. <laughs> when you first start out, you're not wise. 
Like you're gonna start saying something that's gonna make no sense like I just did, or you're gonna, or, or somebody's gonna ask you a question and you're like, I don't know the answer. You know what you tell them? I don't know. Can I get back to you in a few days and give you an answer? Man, can I look it up? Can I, can I come back to you? I know there's an answer. And guess what? You start witnessing the people and you start sharing your faith. All of a sudden, all those questions people ask you, well, guess what? You have all the answers to, right? And you become wise because you know everything that the world is asking. And so you can share Jesus with confidence. Like I said, it takes courage and courage takes practice. And so I encourage you, if you don't feel like you're good enough to share the gospel, just start where you're at. Just take that little step of courage. Those doors, don't force it. But I'm telling you, build those relationships and God is gonna open the door for you to share the gospel. And what if the church took our eyes off ourselves and onto the hurting world around us? Man, I believe that our story is gonna make a difference in the lives of people. I believe you fast forward maybe a week, two weeks, maybe six months, and you can hear stories. I'm so glad the church loved me. Man, I'm so glad that my friends invited me to church when I was 14 years old. Man, I'm so glad that my neighbor took me to lunch and shared Jesus. Man, I'm so glad that person befriended me. I'm so glad that person invited me out to one of those Sundays. Come on, somebody, where that weird preacher dude was talking about Jesus and my life was forever changed. Now, I'm so glad that they left the huddle to go run the play. I'm so glad that that Christian moved my block and so I can meet Jesus. I mean, I'm so glad that person invested in my life. I'm so glad that person called me up and prayed for me. I'm so glad that person I sat next to gave me a hug and said, if, I don't really know you, but if you need anything, I'm always here for you. I love you. And I'm so glad we're a church that's gonna love our neighbor, amen. We're gonna be distracted by the things that are valued to God. We're gonna be distracted by people who are far from Jesus. I mean, it's not gonna be about us. It's not gonna be about what we're doing here. It's gonna be about people who need Jesus the most. Man, we're gonna be a kind of church that can love people, amen. We're gonna love our neighbors. Come on, somebody say love. We're gonna love our neighbors. We're gonna make a difference today. Father, we come before you. God, I pray that our church would see people far from you forever changed, God. That we would never forget, God, that we are here on a mission. God, it's not our idea, God, it was your idea. So God, I pray your spirit would change us from the inside out, God, that we would see lost people saved, lost people come home, God. We're all about the 1%. We, we are called to truly love our neighbors today. Man, as we're talking in this moment, as we're praying right now, maybe God is calling you to take it personal. You know, someone somewhere God has put on your heart. He's calling you to make a difference in the life of someone who needs Jesus. I wonder how many of you today would say, there's someone in your life right now close to God but far from you and he's put on your heart this morning. Would you lift your hands high somebody that's close to God but far from you? or close to you but far from God, he put in your heart that you could witness to this morning, somebody that you can share the gospel with, maybe somebody in your family, maybe a friend, maybe a coworker, he's put in your heart, you begin to pray for them, and you can take the gospel across the street. Man, I wonder how many of you would say, you know what, I wanna be the conduit for God's blessing. Man, I wanna take action. I wanna be the person that God uses to see someone far from God discover life and purpose in Jesus. God, if you're gonna use anyone, God, use me. If that's you this morning, lift your hand high. Use me as a conduit to preach the gospel and to reach people far from you. I see your hands up across the room. God, help us to love our neighbor. God, help us to be the, like the only person that's got the gospel. God, there's no plan B. God, give us the courage to share. God, we make mistakes, we don't know answers. God, give us the wisdom to answer. God, help us to be wise because we shared our faith so much, God, that we know exactly where the pulse of the world is at. God, help us to be sensitive to your voice. God, as you lead us, God, to bless other people with the gospel. God, make our church a church for unchurched people. God, I pray for those that are close to us this morning. God, that are in our families. God, that are coworkers, that are best friends. God, that they would be drawn close to you. God, they wouldn't leave here, God, without an experience with you. God, I pray to prepare their hearts, God, for your grace. God, give us souls. God, if you're gonna use anybody to reach our city, to reach our family, to reach our block, I pray, God, that you'd use us today. As so we keep praying today, nobody looking around. Some of you here today, you might realize, if you'd be real honest to say, Sean, I'm the person someone just prayed for. I'm not sure, where, I'm not exactly where I wanna be. I know some change I need to make in my life. Maybe perhaps you never truly understood the gospel and what he's done for you until this morning. You know, the reality is that every single one of us, and that includes you, God has created us to be with him. That Jesus created us and formed us intimately and gave us a radical purpose. And not only that, the Bible says our sin separates from God. No matter how good we are, our sins cannot be removed by good deeds. But the most amazing thing is this, that we can be made, made right with God this morning by his grace. That God did something for us that we couldn't do on our own, that paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again for us. Why? So that anyone that calls on Jesus, anyone that includes you that calls on Jesus will be saved will be forgiven, will be made new this morning. I, mean, I believe God has brought many people here this morning that need to hear the good news. I Man, you're not here on accident that God put you here this morning. If you made right with God, you can just simply trust in Him. If you pray a prayer that God will forgive your sins, so He'll forgive you all your wrongs on the cross, and the life with Jesus will begin today. You can have a life of purpose, a life of meaning, and begin a permanent relationship with Jesus in this house. Maybe this morning you say, man, I need Jesus. 
Man, I've, I've never, never heard the gospel so clearly. I've never felt God call me to him. But I believe I need Jesus today. I believe he died and rose for me. If that's you, you'd recognize I need Jesus. I want forgiveness. I want new life in him. If that's you this morning, we just put your hand there and say, I need Jesus. I know God's calling me home this morning. Man, I've been doing my own thing, but I need Jesus today. I want to pray for you. If that's your prayer, say, Father God, thank you so much for sending Jesus. God, you created me, you called me, you gave me a purpose. God, thank you for sending Jesus down across my sin. God, I pray, God, that I would find new life in you. Thank you for dying for me. God, I want to live for you. God, you can have my tomorrows. God, I'm going to follow you and I praise in Jesus' name.